All right, let's open up the quiz. What's the longest running game show of all time? Let's make a deal. I'll make a deal with you if you're close. Close. Fast work. Wheel of Fortune. You're close. That's, that's in the top three. What's the longest running game show of all time? Let's make it price is right. Got it. Yeah. Joe, will win. <laughs> you want another prize? Yeah. I'll come up with one later. <laughs> Longest running game show. That's the one. Price is right. 1972. Bob Barker. I think everyone kind of remembers him. Now it's Drew Carey that runs the show. You also have in that list Wheel of Fortune. And you also got Jeopardy. Now, growing up, we would watch these game shows during dinner time. And I'll be blunt with you, those game shows gave me anxiety. Like Wheel of Fortune. Come on, big money! They grab this giant wheel and they spin it. Do, 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 do. I always wondered, is there someone underneath like controlling it? Oh, I feel bad for this person. It's ready to hit bankrupt. Hit the brake. And it just like stops. Because there's always that one time where it's like ding, 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 bankrupt, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> or it's a moment where it hits this. It, elaborate amount of money or this crazy prize and you're trying to win this vacation. One of the toughest ones is Jeopardy. I mean, there's no lifeline. You know, the top three game shows don't have a lifeline where you can call someone or use this little hint to try and get the right answer. You have only a few seconds, you're alive, and there's the moment where you got to answer. Five seconds, Mr. Then they can't get the answer. Ooh, I'm so sorry. Are they really sorry? <laughs> I don't think they are. I really don't. Jeopardy's a tough one. You know? I'll be blunt, man. I don't really know a lot of the answers or the questions, if you would, because they got to phrase the answer in the form of the question. Do you know you live your life on a game show? You treat yourself like you're on Jeopardy? You think you have to have the answer in a few seconds? You think you're all alone? You think that you have no lifeline. You're trying to come up with an answer. Some of you might be guessing and guessing wrong. Some of you might pinch your shoulders back and say, I've guessed right. Have you really? How'd you make your decision? See, here's what I want you to look at. When you go through trials, you're gonna have questions. You're going to think that you have to have an off-the-cuff answer where there's a game show host, and that game show host is not Bob Barker or God rest Alex Trebek's soul. It's God. And God's looking at you saying, five seconds. And what's unfortunate is people are making very hasty decisions during a trial. It's not just when you have extra money and your emotions are tickled. Sometimes you make really, really bad decisions during a trial. You're angry, you're frustrated. How could this happen? Well, I'm gonna try and get my way out of it, and I got five seconds. And some of you feel like any answer is better than no answer because that's what you think you're receiving from God as well. Remember what I'm telling you, and this theme is gonna be throughout the series. You are responsible. You, not me, not Lily, not anyone else. You are responsible for how you react to a trial. You're responsible. You can't blame it on someone else. You can't start a pity party. I can't say, hey Bill, man, after church, can, I, can you just feel bad for me for an hour? I'll pay you. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. I'm not saying you shouldn't have emotions, but if you're gonna let your emotions be your logic, get used to hearing that sound on a game show where it's the buzzer for a wrong answer. What I want to encourage you today is, where are you seeking your wisdom? Are you relying only on yourself? And I'm not here to put you down. I want to lift you back up. Because when we're going through a trial, we feel alone. And ironically, when we feel like we're alone and desperate, we turn to the wrong places and, I hate to say this, the wrong people. Some trials, where I wanted an innocent verdict, I went to the prisoner instead of the judge. Where are you turning? Where are you looking? How do you react to your trials when you don't have the answer? Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time we can be here. 
I pray you just totally build us up, not for pride reasons or to show off, but so that we can live the best life that you've called us to live, so that we can pass faith in Jesus Christ on to others, and that so people would be encouraged to turn to you. Father God, we thank you for this time we can be here. I pray you bless each one. And we ask these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's move like a locomotive. Lights on. <laughs> camera running. Bible open. Let's go to James chapter 1, where Brother Bob read. We're going to jump right down. We looked at the first few verses last week, how we need to persevere during our trials. Now, persevering during a trial is important, but if you're persevering the wrong way, no good. A marathon is 26 miles. Want to make it a lot longer? Go the wrong direction. <laughs> right? The house example. Remember that house example? You could have a great house plan, but if you don't put a roof on it, no good. Or if you think the roof belongs in the basement, hmm, problem. You're not on the right level. And the same thing is true of the trial. You're responsible for how you react. And you're also responsible for where you turn for the answer. You're responsible. You can't blame someone else. You can't say, why me? You're responsible. I'm going to show you this. I hope I can. Anyway. Let's go to verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So here's what James has to say. If any of you is lacking wisdom, it's kind of a hint, hint. We're all going to lack wisdom at one time or another. A young person is trying to increase their initial knowledge and wisdom so that they can pursue a career. People who are up in age should never feel that they've learned everything because things are changing. And a dead person walking is someone who is refusing to we're constantly needing wisdom. Life would be stagnant if mankind didn't pursue wisdom. Remember how Jay turned on the lights? Well, that started with someone persevering in the right direction. We would still be in the dark if it wasn't for someone to keep on trying until the lights came on, if you will. And the same thing is true with us. When we're going through a trial, if we lack wisdom, you know what God says? You can turn it. You can go right to him. If any of you lacks wisdom, go to him. And he will give it to anyone who asks. You don't have to make a tuition check. You don't have to pay the university. You don't have to try and raise up funds in order to try and find the answer. You don't have to get every single answer right. And, and if you don't, you get these consolation prizes, and I think they're leftovers from like Walmart. They give them like folding chairs and this and that, or not folding chairs, but like lawn furniture and stuff like that. They give you this consolation prize. And sometimes some of us feel like if we go to God for wisdom, well, Bill, he'll get what he needs, but me? Nah, I'm gonna get the consolation prize. Well, why? Well, Bill's smarter than me. So if I ask God for wisdom, he's just gonna give me like, you know, the consolation prize, not for nothing. This chair rocks back and forth. I don't even want it. So then you know what? You go your own way, <laughs> thinking that's a better way to go. And let me stop for a minute. It's very easy to just bash you over the head with this. Why aren't you turning to God? What's wrong with you? Where's your faith? Now let's have coffee out. That doesn't work. You know why you don't turn to God for wisdom a lot of times? You're smart. You understand you're not stupid people. I've heard what you have to say. You've accomplished things. And better yet, your job is very demanding. People are paying you for what you know. A dysfunctional employee constantly asks questions. You've been here for 10 years, let's say. It's the basic routine nine to five, and you're still asking questions because you don't know how to do it. You know what they're gonna do? They're gonna probably get rid of that person or they're going to be the office pariah. So and so is impossible to deal with. Here he comes. I have questions about how to send that file. Like we've been doing it the same way for 20 years, and they hide over here from that person. You're expected to know the answer on things without going to anyone else. 
You're expected to fix that drug. You're expected to pass that test. You're expected to give that presentation and help that person without asking questions. And it's expected of you. And here's the best part. They're not going like this. Heather, thanks for coming to work today. How do you like your coffee? It doesn't happen. You do your job, you go through the motions, and then you come back the next day, and even though they're paying you for what you know, they're not, they're not really grateful about it. You can be replaced, you know. So you're expected to have the answer all the time. And asking a question can be a sign of weakness. And asking a question can be, you should know this by now. So now, when we go through a trial, I think a lot of us are carrying that same mentality over. I know I've done it. I can handle this situation at work and just be like, oh, thank God, that's the big question. I can answer that no problem. I can fix that. I can take care of that. I know where that verse is. No problem. You're supposed to know. You're the pastor. Where's that verse? Here you go. But now all of a sudden you're at this point where you can't answer. You're scared. You're frightened. And you're starting to wonder, just like an angry boss, is God disappointed that you have a question? <laughs> you know why you're going through this. Figure it out. And we feel that way. And we're not going to dare tell anyone, especially the pastor, because the pastor might do this. I thought we talked about that. Weren't you listening last week? And then it's a horrible. Sorry if I freaked you out. I freaked out myself just walking over to you like that. But here's the thing. I would never do that to you. I appreciate your, your patience. But here's what I want you to think about. Stop beating yourself up. You're expected to know too much. And get very little in return. That's how the world works. God's not the world. God expects you to be able to say, Lord, I don't have the answer, and I'm turning to you. Lord, I'm asking for forgiveness just because that's what I'm supposed to do. But just because I've sinned doesn't mean I can't turn to you. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't turning to God because they feel like that's a sign of weakness. Well, if you can't control the weather and he can, going to him is not a sign of weakness. And here's my common question. I've asked this before. How's it working out for you? <laughs> By not turning to God. Does it help you? Yeah, I increased my alcohol consumption. It's great. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, I'm miserable at work. Every time someone asks me a question, I smack them in the face. HR loves me. It's not working out. And I've known people, whether they're teenagers or 18 years old, they're going to the wrong places because they feel alone. They don't know the answer. It's not found in a book. You can't ask another co-worker, so they go to something else. And it's frightening how lost people feel. You're expected to know the answer all the time. And God's saying, I'm not expecting you to know the answer. It's okay to turn to me. But unfortunately, there's a key point to turning to God for wisdom. And the verse 6 says this. But when you ask, not if you ask, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. You ever hear people say to you, well, I don't believe that verse. How do you interpret it? Well, let me ask you, how do you interpret that? He's making it very clear that you ain't going to receive bird to do from the Lord if you doubt him. Makes it clear. Are you saying I'm going to hell? No, 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 no. If you doubt the Lord, when it comes to wisdom, it's not this heaven or hell thing. Let's stop making it about halos and pitchforks. It's about trying to find what's best in what God has called you to do. God has called you to be a mother. God has called you to be that employee. What I mean by that employee? Well, out of 20 truck mechanics, you're the one that prays for people. People admire the way you give a presentation, but you're kind. You're not just a healthcare worker that helps through skin. But you help a bleeding heart. 
That's the difference. And when we turn to the Lord for wisdom, it's not a heaven or hell issue. This is about making the best choice. Don't you love multiple choice questions? People think that's the easiest test to take. It's not, because there's more than one right answer, but there's a best answer, correct? And when you turn to the Lord for wisdom, it's about selecting the best answer. Too many people at one point in their life said, don't need God's wisdom. I got it myself. And God's saying this, you pick choice C because statistically that's the one that's usually right, but it was A that was the right answer. And you think you did the best, but you didn't. God is kind. Just like if you fail a test in school, the teacher doesn't have the right to send lightning. But here's the thing. If you don't trust God for wisdom, you're not going to receive anything. Some people avoid the doctor because they're afraid of what the doctor has to say. But I'd rather know and catch it early than to have maybe an early demise because of something I didn't know about. And here's the, the example that James gives. Are you listening? Say amen. Amen. <laughs> here's the thing. He gives an example of how waves in the ocean Waves are strong. Waves can take down a city if they're big enough. But what controls waves is something you can't see, the wind. And sometimes we're controlled more by things we can't see. And the end result is quite powerful. You might have a, an evil spirit in you that you're trying to fight. And that's causing the waves. The waves are powerful, but it's the invisible wind. You see, a personal relationship with God is not understood by reading a pamphlet, but it's through trusting Him. And trusting in the invisible will have visible results. If you want to receive something from the Lord, you're going to have to trust Him. You are going to have to trust Him. And it's quite similar to how you live your life. The doctor tells you to take a certain medicine. You are tearing the rear wheels off your car to get to the pharmacy to get that prescription. Front wheel drive, well, front wheel. But either way, here's what you're doing. You're going to listen to the doctor. And the doctor is great. I'm not putting down the doctor. But the doctor cannot heal the soul. The doctor doesn't have control over your soul. The doctor can take x-rays and find things wrong with you that you didn't know were there. But your soul can't be seen, yet you know it's there. You can feel it. It's what makes someone play an instrument versus making it come alive. The soul is the immaterial part of you that never ages. It can't be taken away. It can't be hurt by a man. So, maybe we should turn to the one who's in charge of it. The Lord above gives grace to those down below. If you trust him, then you'll turn to him. Go to your responsive scripture. I want to show you something important here. Here's the bold part. Here's where I want to end this for today. Here's what it happens to say. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Here's what jumped out about uh, I made mean, about this verse. Shouldn't it say trust in the Lord with all your mind? How come it doesn't say trust in the Lord with all your mind? Because I have battles in my mind, and they're destroying me. It's like this cartoon episode that doesn't ever end, and voices that don't shut up. And I'm trying to battle this, and I want to quit, and I want to give up. So shouldn't I trust the Lord with all my mind? Because I'm smart. You're smart. You fooled people. You figured things out. They turned to you because they couldn't fix it. But now you can't. And you're used to using your mind. But this verse says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know why it's written that way? 
because you'd be a fool to try and understand that. You want to have your faith go down like flushing a toilet? Try to understand God. You'll be miserable. You'll be angry because you're not going to like some of the things that he does. I'm going to tell you that right now. I've never been to a funeral. Never have I been to a funeral where everyone was crying and they pulled me aside and said this, I wish God would have taken them sooner. I mean, we're happy that their suffering is over and that our faith ends in an eternal kingdom. In an eternal kingdom. Can't even get the words out because I'm so jumbled up. But wouldn't you want to see them one more time? Wouldn't you want to have their words grace your ears and nourish your heart one more time? Wouldn't you want to be able to make eye contact with that person who's no longer with us? Of course you would! And you're not going to say to God, I understand why you took them home. Now take them. I got a pastor who'll do the service. I'm not saying that. I got parents who are up in age, and I'm not saying, take that home, God. No way. I'll be ticked off at him the moment he leaves. And I'm not going to understand it. And I'm not going to like it. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you you better accept it or else. But if you're going to try and figure out why God does what he does, you think I'm being loud right now? The voice inside your heart and soul will be so loud it will shake the glass right out of the windows. You will be miserable if you try to trust God through just your mind. If you want to trust God through your mind, you're going to say this. Well, why did God do that? Why did I lose him in Vietnam? Why this? Why can't he put down the needle? Answer me. You have to trust the Lord with your heart. Believe me, I don't take me as this overly humble person. I was an arrogant, snot-nosed little punk when I was in Liberty University thinking, I got some verses memorized. And then God said, you know nothing. You know nothing. Try to stop the wind, son. Try to make a day a little longer. Try to create mankind. Then get back to me. We know very little. Things are changing. But what God wants us to do is to trust him with our heart and lean not to your own understanding. Trust him with all your heart. <laughs> you know how that starts? Are you ready? Right here. <laughs> if he's willing to do this for me, and he had this, by the way, this wasn't just this random Oh my gosh, did you hear what happened? What is it, Moses? They killed your son. Oh, jeez. Don't worry about it. I got the resurrection now. What's the password again? Kill the devil 666? Okay. Got it. All right, my son's back alive again. That's not how it worked. It was part of a very genius plan that none of us could have had figured out. Not even the disciples. They walked with him. They didn't say, I got it. You're going to go on the cross, die, and come back to life as a propitiation. That's what pastors are going to learn long after this. And they're going to try to teach it to people. I get it. We understand that. Not one of them said they understood. They all ran away. They were crying. They were miserable. And the fortitude of virtuous women were the ones that went back to the tomb first. They didn't understand it. They had to trust it with their heart. And when they saw what he did, they said to everyone else, you keep going. We don't have a formula, but you can trust it. Because we doubt it, and so are you. We doubt it, and you're going to doubt it at times too. But don't let doubt capture you like a net, like a fish being caught on a hook, like an animal being shot by the hunter. Be set free in knowing that you can trust God. Guys, I don't want you to think that people have the biggest faith of the stupidest people in the world. Sometimes people have that idea. I'll be honest. Can I say that? Oh, your pastor has a lot of faith? I bet you he don't have a doctor. Because if he did, he'd realize that's a bunch of crap. There are plenty of people who have a doctor who preach better than I do. There are plenty, plenty of people out there 
Well, I have friends who might even be listening to this sermon after the posting. Or maybe I won't post it. Who knows? But there's going to be plenty of people out there who I know who are surgeons who say prayers before they begin. Faith is not about, well, since you're so dumb and you've got nothing else to turn to, start doing your white knuckle prayers and hit the carpet. For me, I got a car with a golden emblem on the hood and enough money to buy you out. It means nothing. And truly wise people know that there are many things that are outside of their hands. And what's outside of your hands, put it to God's. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Don't think that there's something you have to compartmentalize and say, no, nah, that, that I can't give to God, but I'll handle this, I'll give to him. No, 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 no. In all your ways, submit to him. And maybe you'll get an answer. And maybe he'll help you. No. And he will make your paths straight. Great people turn to the Lord above. To throw him out is not going to help you. To try and say that you're all by yourself is going to leave you just that, all by yourself. I want to encourage you through what you're going through today. The Bible is closed, but I hope your ears are open. What you're going through, say specifically to the spiritual doctor above and say, Lord, this is what I'm going through. Help me. And it's not going to be this moment when the sky opens up and little harps and violins and maybe even cellos start playing. <laughs> but what's going to happen is this. A lot of times, this is what happens. You have a peace. And it says this. Keep going. Because a, a runner, a marathon runner, someone who has a transmission taken out of a vehicle and they're saying, I just want to throw this vehicle out. Just one thing at a time. One more bolt, one more this, one more answer on the test. Just keep going. We want, as you can see, one, two, three, game show results. Life is not a game show. That's why it's called a game show, not a this is your life show. You have to understand that when you turn to God for wisdom, a lot of times what you're going to get is this. All right. Can you handle this for your strength? All right, I'll keep going. With that, I'm not going to keep going. I'm going to stop here. But your life continues. May you continue by turning to Him. Christ can forgive us for our sins and promise us an eternal home. And you can't understand that in your mind. Try trusting it in your heart. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we can be here. There's nothing more to say. The rest needs to be lived. And our part two is not the end. Maybe people feel like they're in part two of their trial or part one. May they keep going, turning to you for wisdom. If we try to understand you, mm -mm, we're going to be lost. It says to trust you. And I pray that each person in their heart trusts you. If they have questions, may they turn to you for answers. If they need prayer, pray with each other. Pray with me, whoever. And that's fine. But Father God, may we never turn away from you. If we can trust you for an eternity, I think we can trust you for this short blip on our radar. And Father God, we thank you for this time. We pray these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen, Amen indeed.